So that was a good application of what we learned last time. And I was looking back through last time, the notes and the text. We did not quite get to the second derivative test. So that's going to be the start of today. Um, let's recall first what the first derivative test was. says if f prime of c is 0, so you have a critical point, right? And f prime changes sign at c, then x equals c is the location of a max or min. As we saw in the quiz, our function looks something like this. Up at the very top, it looks like our function levels off. So we would say that f prime at 0 is 0, if it's differentiable. And what do we notice about the sign of the derivative? Well, it's positive over here, and then it's negative over here. The derivative changed signs from one side to the next. The first derivative says we've got either a local max or a local min there. Possibly a global. Okay. There's another way we could determine this actually, and that's called the second derivative. So it's kind of a uh, substitution. For the first derivative test, sometimes it's easier when your function's easy to differentiate and difficult to evaluate. Does that make sense? So I'm just saying there's conditions where this one will be harder than that one, and then there's conditions where that one will be harder than this one. It's just sort of, although at some level it's really just conditions about you, your characteristics. Do you work better at this level or do you work better at that level? Which one are you more proficient at? Uh, use the one you're best at, sort of thing. So the second derivative test says, suppose f prime prime that's the second derivative is continuous at x equals c. This is just like the first derivative test. Suppose we've got a differentiable function and it's 0 at some value. So suppose we've got a continuous second derivative. So at x equals c and nearby. Sorry, I need that as well. That way we can form open intervals around that inflection point. Or sorry, rather around the, uh, any critical points. Part A says if f prime at c is 0, meaning we've got ourselves a critical point where our function levels off. And f prime prime at c is negative, which is exactly the situation we have here. The concavity at this point is roughly like this. Then automatically, without testing derivative values to the right or to the left of this critical point, automatically we know f of c is a maximum. 
Second derivative being negative means our function looks something like this parabola I've drawn here. And if the middle of it has a zero derivative, that means we've leveled off. Means that's definitely a critical point, which is a maximum. Part B just says if f prime of c is zero and the second derivative is positive, then f at c is a minimum. It's the opposite case. function at zero looks something like this, and there's a critical point around here where the slope is zero, then this height is definitely the minimum in the area. And positive concavity at this point is also a critical point, that means it's a minimum. Negative concavity at a critical point means it's a local maximum. So you can, you can kind of use these interchangeably. Um, like I said, if it's simple to find critical points of the derivative, and then you notice, hey, it's really easy to check the second derivative fast as well, maybe you just go right to the second derivative test. Especially if it's difficult to evaluate the first derivative at nearby points. Because remember, back here, you would need to do things like put a test point, put a test point, check to see if the function's going up at this point, check to see if the function's going down at this point, compare the two, and conclude. If that's more difficult than just taking the second derivative and checking its sign at a point, then, you know, use the appropriate tool. There's questions about this. Okay, so two alternatives for finding if something is a maximum or a minimum value for first and second derivative tests. Can I erase? That is it for section 4.3. So we're moving on to section 4.4. This is kind of a big change in topics. Uh, it's almost as if I think this should be in a different section, but it uses some of the same rules, so it's in this chapter, um, but it's quite different. 4.4 is on indeterminate, indeterminate, okay, indeterminate, that word, if, I, if you say you cannot determine something, then that means that thing is indeterminate. To determine means to put your finger on, to tell me exactly what it is. This is going to be about things where you cannot tell me exactly what they are. Okay? Oh boy. But there's going to be a nice trick. For determining them. Indeterminate forms and La Hapital's rule. And I know I'm butchering that pronunciation. And I don't speak French. If I could ask the one French speaker, perhaps, what does this word mean? I think it means hospital, right? Perfect. This is the hospital rule. This is triage for when you don't know what to do. Okay? All right. So, what is an indeterminate form? I think that's got to be the very first thing that we talk about. We're going to 
going to have to go back to limits for this. Okay? There were lots of examples with limits before where we would have division by zero. Right? You remember when we computed derivatives, in fact, every derivative was a limit where the denominator was zero. Every limit. Now, fortunately, through algebraic manipulations and some, some tricks of the trade, we can compute derivatives even though we have essentially a division by zero in the end. Today we're going to talk about things where you have both a zero limit up top and a zero limit in the bottom. For example, this limit. The limit is x goes to 1 of natural log of x divided by x minus 1. If we go way back, we remember to take the limit of a quotient, we might be able to just take the quotient of the limits if certain things, certain conditions are met. One of those conditions was the denominator's limit can't be zero. Right? That, that's one of the conditions. We, this bottom function, when you take the limit, you can't get zero here. So limit laws cannot be applied in indeterminate forms such as this. We call this kind of indeterminate form, which if you were to evaluate, would essentially become a zero over zero. We call this form an indeterminate form. And there are others that we're going to talk about today. So the first two types, 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. Indeterminate forms, maybe I'll try and put this into words. Does your book give that? Indeterminate form, I'll put this into my own words. An indeterminate form is a is a result of a limit. naively get division by zeros, divisions and multiplications by infinities, infinities to infinities, zeros to zeros. So I'm going to put naively get hmm, incalculable Calculable. Can't calculate. I'm going to write that. Can't get, or what we need, naively get things we can't compute. For example, our first two types are division by zero when we have zero up top. And the next type we're going to look at is an infinity value divided by another infinity value. Uh, the other ones we're going to be looking at today, let's see, we've got zero times infinity, we've got infinity minus infinity, we've got zero to the infinity, infinity to the zero, and one to the infinity, and that's going to be everything we're going to go through. So there's going to be all sorts of these forms, which we're calling types of indeterminate forms, where you might be able to apply a trick called the hoppy tolls rule, and uh, you might be able to get something out. Okay.
So is this clear that this is an indeterminate form of type 0 over 0 before I move on? Is that clear? If I let x go to 1, natural log of 1 is 0. x minus 1 becomes 0. This essentially becomes 0 over 0 if we naively just take the limit of each piece. Right? Okay. How about, is it obvious that this is an indeterminate form, uh, 3x squared over 2x squared plus 1? What is this indeterminate form? You naively take the limit. This goes to infinity. This goes to infinity. It's another indeterminate form. Okay? We already know a trick for that one, right? Yeah, good. So these are the first two types of indeterminate forms. Here's going to be a trick. And I need to be extremely particular with this, so I'm going to have to write down every detail. Let f and g be differentiable. functions and they have you have to be able to find their derivatives. Okay, if you can't find their derivatives, this whole rule is gone. Okay. And the derivative of g at x is not zero on an interval. I'm going to call that interval i, which contains a. a is a number. Okay. When we're taking our limits, this is what we're going to be calling a in a little bit. This infinity would be our value a. Okay, so just beforehand. Beginning of the Hopital's rule is describing a limit process. We've got a function divided by another function. We want to make sure that this derivative of this function is not zero when we get close to this number here. But in classic limit fashion, we don't really care what happens at a. Remember, limits only care about the approach. They don't care what actually happens here. They just care about when you're close. We had all sorts of strange things where a, a function can come up to a certain height, which I'll call 10 in this picture. So the limit of my function here as x goes to a is 10, even if my function is defined as 20 at Right, the limit is 10, even though the actual function value is way up here. Limits don't care what the actual value is, they care when you get close to something. Okay. I'm going to continue over here. And suppose the following. This basically is just going to put us on this type 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity foundation. The limit as x goes to a of x of x equals 0, and the limit as x goes to a of g of x is 0, or the limit as x goes to a of f is infinity, and the 
limit as x goes to a, or g of x is infinity. Two situations, the two inter indeterminate forms that we have. So we've got a function dividing another one, call the top one f, call the bottom one g. Let's make sure they're differentiable, we can find the derivatives. Let's make sure we can find the derivatives anywhere close by this guy. And let's suppose that one of them up top and the one on bottom have the same limit, either zero or infinity. Okay? Then we have sort of a surprising result. This is the punchline. And the limit as x goes to a of f of x over g of x is equal to the limit as x goes to a of f prime of x over g prime of x. Whenever the limit on the right, this one, exists or is plus or minus infinity. It's entirely possible that you take derivatives of things and you take the limit of that and suddenly you don't have an existence limit. But whenever it does exist, you definitely have this equality that the original limit you were asking about is equal to this limit. So what does this tell us? This Hoff Tall's rule tells us. Tells us that there's a relationship between functions and limits of ratios of functions, right? And limits of their slopes. So if you take a ratio of any two functions that satisfy certain properties, then you can get information from just their slopes. Whatever information you could get from the original function ratio, you could also get from the ratio of their slopes. In some sense, information is preserved through taking derivatives. In some sense. That's what this says. So in words, the Hopital's rule relates ratios of functions, function values, to ratios of slope values. Which is really uh, perhaps not intuitive. Maybe it is, I don't know. How many of you would be excited if I had you write down a table of values for this? And tell me what the limit was. It's okay if you say no. It's fine. Yeah, I know, right? I wouldn't. I'd much rather use a tool to just get the limit out. Right now, as it is, I, I can't exactly naively take this limit, so that's kind of kaput. But this tool is going to let us differentiate both of these guys, equate the limit, and say, hey, it's the same as that. Okay? So let's use this as our first example. Let's make sure that this function and this function satisfy the La Hopital's rules conditions. Then we'll take the derivatives and we'll see if we can find that limit. If we can't, we're going to do this iteratively. We're going to ask for the second thing that we get. Can we take derivatives of the top and bottom? Do they satisfy these? And if they can, if we can, then we're going to apply La Hopital's rule again and again and again until we either find the original limit or until we find something that doesn't exist. 
in which case we're going to have to go back and make a table. Okay? So, ask yourself the questions. Here's app. Can you differentiate that? small interval which contains one where I can find this derivative. Here's zero, here's one. I can find the derivative of natural log not there, but anywhere over here. So is there a small interval around this one that I can find the derivative in? Absolutely. Pick any fraction and then any number bigger than one and we've got ourselves an interval is open and contains one. Okay? G. Well, G prime is one. All right. For which numbers can I find that derivative? Any number. This function is continuous and it's differentiable everywhere. So is it continuous and differentiable in this interval, which I've noted for natural log? Absolutely. Okay, so we've got ourselves differentiable functions. Is g prime zero? Nope. Is it zero on this interval, which we've found by inspection? Definitely not, because it's never zero. Okay, is the limit of f of x zero? The limit is x goes to one of natural log. Yes. Natural log of x. You think about that function. When is it equal to 0? That's when e to the 0 equals 1. Right? So when x goes to 1, natural log goes to 0. So we definitely have the limit as x goes to 1 of natural log is 0. Okay, check. And does the limit of x minus 1 as x goes to 1, does that equal 0? Check. Okay, boom, 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 boom. Everything's satisfied. So we can just apply the hoppy tolls rule on this interval. It says, in fact, this is in fact the same as this limit, 1 over x over 1, f prime divided by g prime. I'm just going to rewrite this. Okay? Can you tell me that limit? Does it exist? What is it? One. <coughs> ah, so zero divided by zero in this case is one. That's just a direct application of the Hopital's rule in this indeterminate form of zero over zero. No. Let's do the other one. Apply the Hopital's rule to that one. We know the answer, right? To that one up there. We know the answer off the top of our heads. This one. Can I erase what I did over here with natural log over x minus 1? Okay, you erase. I don't want to erase the Hopital's rule because we need to keep it up there. Though. 
go through the checklist. Okay, naively, we're going to take each of these, this is f of x, this is g of x, we're going to ask ourselves every question here, are these guys differentiable? Yeah, they're polynomials, right? 3x squared is differentiable. Its derivative is 6x. Okay, g of x is a polynomial. Its derivative is 4x. Is this ever 0? Absolutely. It's 0 when x is 0. Is 0 anywhere close to infinity? No, so for the interval, we're just going to take any interval which does not include 0. So like 10 to infinity. Hey, there's an interval on which this guy is differentiable and its derivative is not 0. But even, even so, uh, we could change this to be like 1 or 2 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. And this doesn't come into play um, because the derivative is not 0 at infinity. The derivative is infinity at infinity. Okay. Now, we ask ourselves, is the limit of f 0? No. So we're not in this case. Okay. Is the limit of f infinity? Yeah, yeah. As x goes to infinity, 3 times x squared also goes to infinity. Okay. Does g of x go to infinity? Well, if x goes to infinity, 2x squared plus 1 also gets really, 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 really big. So that also goes to infinity. So we're, we're solidly in this second situation here, which is indeterminate type infinity over infinity. And we're just going to apply the Hopkins rule on this interval, which I'll now erase because it doesn't really matter. So this limit equals the limit as x goes to infinity of 6x over 4x. Can you tell me that limit? If not, we can try and satisfy the conditions and go one step further because the derivative of this is 6 and the derivative of this is 4 and the ratio of 6 over 4 never changes no matter what x is and the limit is just 6 fourths. Or, we simplify this, which we can do, because derivatives have a really nice property of eliminating constants in the sum. This is a nice way of toning down, paring down polynomials. This is just 6 over 4, because you can cancel the x's. We had this nice standard trick last time where if you've got something like this, you factor out x squared. Right? And then you can cancel out 1 over x squared on top and bottom. And then the infinite limit pops right out. Okay, that's another alternative to this trick. Questions on Le Hopital's rule? We've got more forms we're going to dig into. Probably just one more form. another kind of indeterminate form which says what if some function goes to zero and the other function goes to infinity 
So we've got a product of functions. And this essentially, naively, becomes one of these two things. So either f goes to infinity or goes to zero, and the other one goes to the other. There's this question of which one wins the war. Because multiplication by huge numbers gives you huge results. And multiplication by numbers close to zero gives you really small results. Right? So in this type of question, we're really asking, can we determine which one wins this product war? Which function gives a larger input, a larger multiplicative factor in the end? It should be intuitive that the hoppy calls rule tells us exactly which one's going to win. It's the one with the bigger slope. Which one goes to the number faster? Right? If this number goes to zero faster than this thing goes to infinity, this is probably going to be zero. Or some constant. If this number goes to infinity faster than this one goes to zero, then we're probably going to have not a nice number. Maybe infinity. Okay? So, let me ask you this. What is the relationship between? times g and f over 1 over g or b g over 1 over f. Is there any difference? Is there any comparison? Or is this just algebraic shenanigans? I claim that there's literally no difference. Well, what were you going to say, Fred? Yeah, I was going to say, I put term G the same as that over the other. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Can you see that? I can take something like this and rewrite it like one of these two things. Right? So that's not a, that's not a surprise anymore to him, right? I can take this and rewrite it to get this or this, and I haven't changed the thing. That's an important step. My follow-up question is, what does that do for us? by smaller and smaller numbers, closer and closer to zero. What's the result? What would you hope it would be? So if f is the one that goes to 0 and g is the one that goes to infinity, so 0 and infinity, 
and I rewrite it like this. we hope this indeterminate form becomes infinity over infinity, right? This transformation might allow us an application of law of also. That sure would be nice. We'll pick that up next time. Don't forget, next time we'll have a quiz. You'll have to construct the graph of a function from derivative information, second derivative information, maybe some horizontal axis. Just like the beginning of class today. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, okay?